I am really excited to introduce our next doctor that we'll be talking with. Dr. New, thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Now, I know your name is really not Dr. New, so <laughs> I would like you to tell everybody how to pronounce your full... We all call you Dr. New. Yes. But what is your official name if someone's looking so, for you? So, <laughs> my real name is James New and Schwander, uh, <laughs> but obviously we shorten it to New because I can't say New and Schwander all day long, so I don't expect anybody else to either. So, and many of us that know you, we call you Dr. New, and, but just in case people are watching and they want to Google you, it's a lot better to just tell your full name. Now, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing and, and where your practice is? Sure. Um, I have a practice in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and it is essentially an integrative medicine practice, uh, family practice, so we see all ages. Uh, part of my practice is uh, treating kids with developmental delays, like autism. Um, but for the most part, my practice is treating chronic illness of any age, uh, using both medical and integrative approaches to uh, patient issues. And so um, I know one of the things that you work on with a lot of your patients um, is working on the microbiome. Right. Um, a lot of families might not know first what is microbiome, so can we talk about what that is first? Sure. Um, I, in its broadest sense, the microbiome is this concept that um, we are only partly human, we are an ecosystem, part of which is human DNA, uh, and at least half, maybe more than that, is bacterial, viral, fungal DNA. So in general, all of those organisms that are not human, we're going to call them microbiome. And then there are individual microbiomes in the body. So your skin has a microbiome, your sinuses have a microbiome, your digestive tract has a microbiome. Uh, so those are also referred to as microbiomes. And then it turns out with the newer technology we have, where we can sequence DNA in anything, uh, in any tissue fluid, it turns out that there's microbial DNA in our brain, and our blood. So there's microbiomes everywhere in the body. Primarily when you're talking microbiome uh, with autism, you're typically talking the gut microbiome. So these are the collection of bacteria, yeast, uh, fungi that are growing in the gut, some of which belong there and some of which don't. And so when you're working with a family member that uh, might have a child with autism, um, why is it so important to look at the microbiome? Because <laughs> poop is everything. <laughs> no. um, so it turns out that um, the, the vast majority of the symptoms that you'll see in autism are influenced by the microbiome. So the, the organisms in the gut will directly produce uh, neurochemicals, so they are actually neurotransmitters like serotonin, dopamine, those kinds of things. People don't realize that the vast majority of neurotransmitters are actually made outside of the brain. And for example, with serotonin, it, it's over 90% comes from the gut organism, so that's made in the microbiome. The microbiome, the organisms will also make um, uh, metabolic byproducts, um, for example, um, butyric acid or propionic acid. These are things that feed the gut, but they also impact the brain. So it turns out if you have the wrong kind of organism in the gut and it makes propionic acid, it can actually induce some of the symptoms of autism. It also influences the immune system. So you hear about these syndromes, pandas, pans, you know, these kids that are, oh yeah, my child had 26 ear infections in the first year of life. Yeah, that's immune dysfunction, right? So that immune system is also impacted by the, the gut microbiome. And then we also see uh, effects from what's called the autonomic nervous system, particularly the vagus nerve. The vagus is the nerve that controls all the um, parasympathetic function to the heart, to the pretty much the entire digestive tract except for the descending colon. Um, so it's really going to be involved with how well you, you make digestive enzymes, how well you make um, acids in your stomach, but also it controls anxiety and fear and those kinds of things that we see in a lot of these kids. So not that anxiety is a you know, core symptom of autism, but you know, how many kids on the spectrum do we see anxiety, right? And so they start stimming because they're anxious. But a lot of that is, is influenced by the function of the vagus nerve. And that vagus nerve is influenced by what's going on in the gut. So it's a two-way street. 20% from the brain down to the gut with the vagus, 80% from the gut to the brain. So what's going on here is directly impacting the brain from the vagus nerve as well. So you have indirect effects, you have direct effects, but if this thing ain't working, this thing ain't working either. And that, that's the important connection. And so it sounds simple. Let's just fix the microbiome. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> yeah, that's the, dream. that's the dream. So, so how do we help it? How was the first Well, step? you know, I tell people the, 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 the first thing with the most straightforward way to change the microbiome is to change what you're eating. All right, so 
we're, again, this is an ecosystem. So what you put into the ecosystem determines what the ecosystem is, right? If you take a rainforest and you take away the rain, you're not going to have a rainforest anymore. You're going to have a desert, right? So it's the same thing when you're eating. If you change what you're eating, you're going to change the organisms that you're feeding. And by doing that, you can improve the outcome. And this is part of why you know, we look at getting people on gluten-free, dairy-free diets. But even before we go there, it's, it's get rid of the toxins, get rid of the, the crap that's in our food, because there's a lot of it. You know, focus on food that is dye-free and, and, and uh, uh, additive-free kind of food. Look at organic foods, because not that there's zero in terms of the toxins, but there's far less of those things in the food. Doing that will change the microbiome. Um, you know, there's all kinds of diets out there. When you look at, like, specific carbohydrate diet, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to minimize a critical nutrient for yeast uh, through your diet. And by doing that, what happens? You reduce the yeast, you change the biome. So that's the most important way to do it. The second is to, tar to use prebiotics and probiotics. So prebiotics are just things that bacteria feed off of, primarily they're soluble fiber type uh, nutrients. So you can get these from grains, but if you're trying to minimize grains, you can get them from your vegetables, you can take them as supplements, there's some fruit sources of these things as well. Those are important. And then probiotics, taking good bacteria, and again, the key ingredient here is the studies are saying 99 plus percent of all these probiotics are killed by stomach acid, so you better make sure you got something that is going to make it through the stomach. Uh, and then the ultimate way to change it is to do a fecal transplant. You know, the trouble we have in the United States is it's only in the U.S. it's only legal to do a fecal transplant for a gut infection called C. diff and really What is a fecal anything. transplant? Because I mean I, I think it's I know. exactly what it sounds <laughs> That's like. That's what I'm saying. No, so basically what you're doing is you're taking um, the, the biome, you're taking the bacteria from a healthy person's stool, literally you're taking their stool, you're processing it to get rid of <laughs> all the crap and leave just the bacteria that are there and then you're giving that to a person who has symptoms. So in the case of uh, in the U.S., the only legal indication for that is, is something called C. diff colitis. So C. diff is a type of clostridia. You get it when you get many, many antibiotics, and it actually creates a uh, uh, colitis. You actually get inflammation in the colon. These people are miserable. So with C. diff colitis, um, you can either take it as a capsule, so 30 or 40 of these frozen capsules of somebody else's stool bacteria. Uh, some gastroenterologists are doing it with a colonoscopy. They'll actually do the colonoscopy, inject the stool water as they're withdrawing the colonoscope. Some people are just doing it as a high end, and then you get a long end of the tube, and I'll put that in. And it's like a one-time thing? It's a one-time thing for C. diff. Okay. Now, when you're talking changing uh, a biome over, because C. diff is easy to treat. You get enough good bacteria in there, you get rid of C. diff. One treatment, it's, it's 85 90% effective at getting rid of antibiotic-resistant C. diff. When you're talking about changing somebody's biome, usually you have to do multiple doses. So the typical course might be two weeks, uh, maybe 10 days out of the two weeks, you're getting daily uh, fecal transplants, either rectally or orally. Um, and then the most important thing, again, is you've got to change the diet because if you do a fecal transplant, and you know typically you'll see changes in a few days. So because part of my practice is also adults, I see lots of adults with fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, environmental sensitivities. Within two or three days, they'll change. And so it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, the kids on the spectrum, it, it's a little bit harder to see the changes, but you'll see behavioral changes. You'll see some improvement in the language. Uh, and you definitely see improvement in the gut symptoms, right? But again, if you do this fecal transplant, they're better. You go back to the same lousy diet, guess what's going to happen? It's You're almost as if when you work out and you eat well, you lose weight, your body does well. But if you went back to eating donuts, yep. Yep. it's going to really, yeah, really go right back to what you work. were doing. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it's, um, it's very difficult to um, convince somebody of this, but the advantage of the fecal transplant is you don't have to convince them because they'll see the progress just with the fecal transplant. And then when you explain to them ahead of time, look, you're not going to maintain that success if you don't change your diet. Because if you don't feed those organisms you, you just put in there, they're all going to die. And obviously the key thing with a fecal transplant, the donor. You have to have a healthy donor. Um, and, and it turns out that the, the key to a fecal transplant is to have a diverse biome that you're giving this person. So we need multiple, multiple different organisms. And these are, you know, if you look at a, a um, 
probiotic, a good probiotic, you know, 100 billion, 400 billion, you know, those kinds of numbers. I mean, a fecal transplant, you're getting tens of trillions of bacteria all at once. So you, you do that for two weeks, you're going to have a significant impact on the gut. Um, and again, when you do it rectally, you're bypassing the stomach. Or if you do it orally, typically they will use an acid blocker to neutralize the stomach pH and then use frozen capsules. So by the time they're oh. thawed, they're through the stomach. Okay. So, um, so in that, a sense, you're taking frozen poop. Yeah, you're basically taking <laughs> frozen poop capsules. <laughs> but if it works, hey. Yeah. Um, so yeah. but how do people find doctors like that, though? Well, um, I use um, I, I use a clinic outside the U.S. Um, in, um, there's a clinic in England that does these, and they have a satellite in Vancouver. They have a satellite in the Bahamas. Um, and the one in the Bahamas, I know, treats kids, so I send them down there. The nice thing is I know how they get their the, the stool sample. And so they have uh, 20 donors that they pay they sort of control what they're eating, so they're on this hyper-diverse diet. They have to eat 100 different foods a week. Wow. Yeah, so it's very, very diverse. They test the donors. They don't release the stool until the donors are retested three months later, so they'll take the stool sample, process it, and freeze it, and then three months later retest the donors so we know that nothing was developed in the interim, and then they test the stool itself. Again, they're using DNA sequencing to test stool, so you can find you know, abnormal viruses, fungus, whatever, and that goes in the, in the trash bin. Um, so it's very clean. And they, regardless of whether you're having this done in the Bahamas or in Vancouver or in England, um, it's the stool is from the same source. And, and that's important. They actually said when they went to the Bahamas, they couldn't find any donors that have a diverse enough ecosystem wow. to qualify. Uh, they so, weren't eating enough different. Right. Yeah. Like the diet was pretty restricted. So when you so you talked about the, the the microbiome and trying to find different ways, so let's say you can't get a fecal transplant, right? Because right? not everybody's going to get to Correct. do that. What other recommendations can you have other than changing your diet? Obviously, right. adding probiotics. Yes. Yeah, so the other the other big thing we use with the gut is to use uh, we call them HDCs. These are um, uh, a type of uh, rat tapeworm larva. All right. Now we actually harvest them from grain beetles. This used to be part of our food supply. Remember as a kid making chocolate chip cookies and the things were falling in there and it was like grain beetles and it took me a while to get over that and still not all that fond of chocolate chip <laughs> cookies. But um, so we used to get exposed to this stuff all the time and that's part of the problem is our food is way too clean. And this is based on this idea that <clears throat> people that grow up on farms around animals have far less of all of this chronic stuff. So whether it's whether it's autoimmunity or allergy, you know, and again a lot of these behavioral issues like autism really think that this is an autoimmune encephalitis that's creating most of the autism mm -hmm. cases. So, you know, again, you fix the gut, you fix the immune system, you help the autism. So the, um, the idea is that people grow up on farms, they have far less of this stuff, and when they move to cities, they lose that benefit. So there's something about animal parasites that actually helps our immune system. So these parasites are critical because they don't make us sick. All right? and other parasites, even though we're not the host animal, like Course, those things can still get out of our gut and travel to places they shouldn't go and make us sick. <clears throat> With the HDCs, they stay in the gut always. And these things, they're larvae, so they'll wander around for two, three weeks because we're not um, rats, um, at least most of us. <laughs> then they don't know what to do when they die. All right? But in that process, they'll change the signaling in the gut, and that will change the biome, and that will change the immune response. So again, that's another big way to, to, to change that biome. But those are the big things. And then, you know, the, the, yeah, the other big way to address all this stuff is to detox. I mean, we don't talk enough about that because uh, everybody wants to know, you know, what's the latest supplement? Well, you know, let's do stem cells. Let's do fecal transplants. Let's do whatever. But detoxing is so uh, such a core issue as well because there's so many things in our food that will mess up that biome. You know, they're either antibiotics or they, they upset the permeability of our intestinal tract. Our, um, they affect the immune signaling in our intestinal tract. And detoxing can make a big difference with the biome as well. But, I mean, if you're going to say, what's the take-home message? How do you change the biome? Diet, 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 diet. And that's something everybody can do everybody right can. now. They're watching this. Every, I mean, I always think of this when people tell me, oh, my child won't eat this, my child won't. You know, they, if I try to buy them that, they won't even touch it. 
And I always, I often think back when my son was two and a half years of age, he wasn't going to the grocery market picking up food or cooking for himself. So it was whatever I was bringing home, whatever I was cooking. The nice thing also about being able to have the power to change your diet, I personally think, is you don't have to be on a waiting list to see a doctor. You can go to any market that's pretty much open. If you stay in the produce section and the meat section, you're you're pretty safe, you know, when you're looking for organics and uh, hormone-free type things. So yeah, I, I love that message. No, and that's what I tell my patients is, you know, because let's face facts, I mean, very few of us have an unlimited budget, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have to eat, mm -hmm. you have to feed your child. Sorry, you do. You have to feed your child. And the whole idea is if you're going to spend money on something, why not spend a little bit more and get quality food? Absolutely. You know, get quality food into that child. You know, if, if all they eat is this food, all right, then at least get organic, grass-fed, whatever. Mm -hmm. Get the least toxic version of that food. And then start adding things in, sneak them in, just start moving towards the goal. The better you do the nutrition, I mean, it becomes the snowball effect. The better you start adding those nutrients in, the better that child's going to do. You know, Absolutely. and you don't necessarily have to go spend four or five, six hundred dollars a month on supplements or, or you know, uh, therapies or whatever. Uh, you can do it with the time. Absolutely, we are what we we are what we eat, right? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I have so enjoyed talking with you. Um, I have one last question sure. for you. For a parent out there that is just getting the diagnosis for the first time, they're sitting there, they're scared, they don't know where to go, they don't know where to turn, what advice can you give them? Well, the biggest thing, unfortunately, is they're going to have to self-educate. They have to learn what's available. They have to learn what autism is about. I, I refer them to um, uh, organizations like MAPS, which is the Medical Academy of Pediatric Special Needs. Uh, these are doctors that are um, trained in biomedical interventions. Um, but the, the, the key thing is to get themselves educated. Unfortunately, most pediatricians are still in that mindset. You know, this is a psychiatric diagnosis, therefore the only treatment is therapy, you know, that we're going to do ABA. And when you say, well, what about all these gut symptoms? Oh, that, that's the psychiatric diagnosis. What about their headaches? Oh, that's the psychiatric diagnosis. No, there's so many medical things that we can do. And we all know what it's like to have a gut ache. We all know what it's like to have a headache. You know, how well do you function neurologically when you have that? Not very well, yeah. right? And so whatever you can do to get yourself educated, and, and like you were saying, start with the stuff you can do yourself. You can change your child's diet. Okay, you can do that. You can start with some basic detox. You can do that. And then get a hold of a doctor who knows biomedical intervention because your neurologist probably isn't going to know that. Your pediatrician probably isn't going to know that. And probably your ABA therapist isn't going to know that. You know, so the key thing is find somebody in your area that does that. And there's enough of us out there find someone. Um, but still, you're going to have to become an expert. You know, I've, I've had a lot of forced learning from my, we call them warrior moms, <laughs> you know, from my warrior moms <laughs> that have, have really pushed me into learning more of this stuff. It's part of life. Well, we appreciate it. Oh, and we're, we're so grateful to have doctors out there, out there like you cheering for our kiddos and making sure that, you know, we don't give up. So thank you for not giving up. <laughs> and uh, thank you for being here today. Thank you. <laughs>